Okay, so I'm going to pass over to Matt. So Matt's going to speak for kind of 15, 20 minutes, um, and then we'll have time for Q&A. And if you have a question, just dump it in the Q&A and we'll, we'll try and get through them, maybe kind of through the presentation, but probably just afterwards as well. Um, yeah, you're going to interrupt me, aren't you, if the question's relevant. And I'll, I'll yeah. try not to get distracted by the questions. All right. Um, right, yeah. So where to start with this? It might actually be helpful, Theo, to run the other poll just to understand kind of where everybody's at with their, yeah. their transition. Um, so essentially, I've been making a living since we published the Cucumber book in about 2011, helping organizations, teams, individuals to implement these practices. And what I've seen over the years is that there are a lot of mistakes that organizations make that get in the way of their own success. So you might have a really motivated team. You might have really keen people on the team to, to make these ideas work. They, they might really believe in the benefits and then things happen around them that make it very difficult. So much as growing plants, is a lot about the environment that you create for the plant. Um, making practices like BDD take root in your organization and really grow and mature and, and become something that starts to give you benefits, you need to create the right environment for those teams. So those of you especially who are sort of managers um, are going are gonna to hopefully find this presentation useful in that you're going to see ways where your organization, things that you can do something about, maybe getting in the way of the team having the success that, that you'd like for them. So I'm actually going to frame this, um, this presentation in a different way from advertised. I'm going to tell you about 10 common mistakes that, that we see teams making. And then we'll go through kind of looking at it from the other angle about what you can do about it to, to, uh, to avoid these mistakes. So running through them quickly, I've got 10, 10 failure modes. You might be doing any or all of these, hopefully not all of them. So one thing that you can try that you can do wrong is to try and change everything all at once. I'm going to go through these more, more in detail in a minute. So I'll just tell you what they are. You can, you can try and change everything all at once. You can make it mandatory, so you can take, uh, you can take it to boss level and push this upon teams. You can keep the pressure on them to deliver, so um, trying to get them to you know, fix the car while the car's still moving. You can avoid thinking about any kind of investment that you might need to make in the infrastructure and um, automation that the teams are going to need to support them in their in their. Uh, BDD practice. You can just keep it focused on the tool. So forget about anything around collaboration or any of the people problems that are going to come with that. You can keep the silos strong. So keep everybody in their own um, specialisms, make sure the QAs don't talk to the developers. You can have a messy backlog. So just being, you know, beginner level at, at some, some of the fundamental agile practices, have a, a backlog that's poorly ordered poorly refined that can really help to fail and um, try and avoid anyone who's got any previous experience so anybody who has done this sort of thing before can speak about it confidently um, those kind of people are a really bad idea and also if you are writing feature files um, if your teams have have started to do that uh, then at least try and make sure that they stay hidden and uh, another really good idea for how to fail is to is to start on really kind of tough terrain, like a, a, a good gnarly legacy code base. Um, that can be a really good one as well. So these are my 10, 10 kind of patterns. So let's go through each of them in detail. So trying to change everything all at once. So there's two levels for this really. Um, one is at the organizational level. So um, you, you, you're an executive, you're, you're a, a manager, you're convinced of the benefits of BDD. Um, it, it looks great. So why not get all of your teams to start doing it all at the same time? Um, that's a really good way to sort of spread what resources you have for, uh, for learning 
um, spread them really thin. And, you know, really only the outlier teams are going to be the teams that will stand any chance of success. Uh, the other thing you can do is at a team level, um, just make sure that every team starts trying to implement BDD straight away on everything, right? Don't let them just run it as a sort of fail safe experiment on one or two stories. Make, just get them to start doing it whole, wholesale straight away. Um, that's a great way to get the team to just sort of thrash around getting nowhere, um, feeling like this is way too hard for them and uh, alienating the business because they're not able to produce anything anymore. So that's a good idea. Throw everything at it. Try, try and change everything all at once. And a kind of couple to that is um, making it mandatory. So, uh, you know, when you want to introduce a change, um, a really good way to build up solid resistance to that change is to force it on people. Don't try and get their buy-in. Don't give them any way to give you feedback or to talk to each other about the implications of the change. Um, so try and close down as many of those, those communication uh, channels as possible. Just make it all top down. Make sure everybody knows that this is the, this is the way things are going. Um, and, you know, either get on the bus or, 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 um, or find, find, a, find a different bus to get on. That's, that's another another really good way to to um, to get this to fail because you will have skeptical people. Um, there are always skeptical people about changes when when you try and introduce them. And um, you know, if you start listening to those people, listening to their concerns, you're 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 really um, you're really on hiding to nothing. Um, and and again, similarly, when we're thinking about sort of evoking authority. Um, when teams start to implement BDD, they will slow down initially. We wouldn't be doing this, we wouldn't be talking about this if we didn't expect them to ultimately speed up. But if you've ever learnt a musical instrument, if you've ever practiced a sport, if you've ever, ever really developed any kind of a skill um, outside of your work, you will know that it takes deliberate practice. It takes time out of the regular day-to-day -day performance work to practice and improve your skills. And that's an investment. That's a, that's a, a hump that you're gonna, go, gonna need to go over. And um, so if you want the teams to fail, a really good way to do that is make sure that the, the pressure to deliver at the same rate as before is maintained on that team. So really keep that pressure up. Make sure that you don't get any breathing room. You're also going to find as they uh, start to try and do this stuff, as they start to try and automate tests, run automated tests against the system, they're going to need to be able to spin up the system on their own developer workstation so they can run their tests locally. They're going to need to be able to quickly provision an environment which is clean. You know, there's no, nothing in the database where they can run a set of automated tests uh, and they're going to need to be able to do that stuff regularly, several times a day, quickly, um, painlessly, automatically. And you probably can't do that at the moment. You may not be able to do that at the moment. If you can't, that's going to require some investment. So um, again, if we're, if we're trying to fail, a really good way to do that is just to ignore that need. Um, get each of the teams to try and do it on their own. Don't have anything strategic going on to invest in that stuff. Um, don't support the teams. You know, if you're going to have like cloud servers that are available to teams, make sure that it's all managed by a central team with a ticketing system. Um, so the teams have, have, you know, got as little access to those servers as possible. Um, all that kind of good stuff. But yeah, as, as much as possible, this is, a, this is a really good way to sort of slow, slow the whole thing down. Um, talking of technology, focusing on the tools. So everybody knows Cucumber is uh, everybody on this call probably knows that Cucumber is really a tool for facilitating collaboration, right? It's a tool for running automated tests, but the beauty of those, those automated tests is that it can be read, read uh, or even written by anybody on the team. Um, but let's try and avoid thinking too much about that collaborative stuff and just really focus on um, the technology, on the automation, on the different tools that we can use for automating our, our application. Um, and, and as much as possible, go down that rabbit hole and avoid um, working on any of the stuff to do with, with collaboration. And in that same spirit, if we think about the different roles 
that might want to be included in any kind of BDD transition, uh, we really like to think about these three amigos, don't we? So your, your uh, domain experts or, or product owner or business analyst, your QA or test professional and your developer. And the more you can keep those three groups still separated. So, um, you know, having the business analyst or product owner writing scenarios on their own rather than collaborating with anybody else. Um, having all of the test automation be done by the testers um, and ideally after the development's been done. Um, just keep, keep the barriers up as much as possible between those three groups because, you know, if they start talking to each other, all hell's going to break loose. Um, you want to try and yeah, make sure your backlog is as messy as possible. So BDD is a, a, a really sort of tactical practice that happens at a fairly low level uh, on a team at the, you know, a, a few days or weeks before development's going to start. Um, and we use it to try and break down a, st a story, test out whether we really understand it and break it down into small pieces of work that we can, we can quickly uh, deliver. So, um, a good way to stymie that process is to have sort of random mishmash of ideas, poorly prioritized, really poorly understood ideas in the in the backlog, um, so that when you're trying to pull things off that backlog to to do discovery work on them, um, the the whole thing just gets stuck because no nobody can really answer the questions that the team have got. Um, that's a really good way to sort of make the whole experience of doing BDD look um, look really painful. Um, can be a little bit embarrassing at times, so you know, um, it, it, it make make sure you're you know you're you're putting the blame on the team rather than um, taking any responsibility, seeing any responsibility at the system level. Um, but yeah, uh, having a messy backlog is a really good one, and yeah, people with previous experience. So I don't know if you've ever met anyone who's uh, successfully used TDD or BDD on a on a project in the past. I certainly have, and those people have got a kind of glint in their eye, like they, they've, they've seen how good it can be and they wouldn't go back. Um, and you really need to avoid these people like the plague. You know, they're going to give you confidence. Um, the, they're gonna, that, that confidence can seep out all around the place to other people um, because it, it is, it, no, you, don't, you really don't want that, Theo. Yeah, um, I mean, really, the, the, the whole thing... Um, when we're, when we're going through this initial investment, you know, it feels like a hump, we feel the pain and we want people to get put off at that early stage, right? Um, and, and walk away and, and, and uh, you know, go and find something else to do, go and find another, another silver bullet. Um, and if you've got these people around who've been through the hump, they know how good it can be on the other side, they'll start telling stories and, you know, um, you can get real problems that way. So try and keep those people away um, from your teams as much as possible. Similarly, uh, if they are writing feature files together, um, it's really good if they can just kind of disappear off into source control and never, never really be seen again. You don't want people to start thinking about these artifacts as being documentation about the system, really just seeing them as tests, you know, that like we talked about before about um, focusing on the tools, keeping everybody in silos. Um, it's really good if the feature files can just get hidden away so that there's, there's a lack of shared ownership um, and the developers kind of, yeah, developers see it as their thing. They, they don't need to get any feedback. They don't really need to take a lot of pride in how they look or how they read. Um, and, and uh, yeah, and they're not getting feedback from, from business people. That, again, is a really good way to make this stuff fail. Oh, yeah, and my favorite um, is... Again, let's let's go back to the sort of sports analogy, right? Um, if you were to take up, I don't know, soccer, um, a great place to start out your playing career, right, would be playing for you know Real Madrid in the Champions League. You you want to set the bar really high and go and try and do this stuff in the hardest possible environment right away. Everybody knows that's the right way to learn things, um, and it's no different for programmers learning to do TDD. Give them you know, give them the, the oldest, gnarliest Java 5 legacy code base. It's a perfect place for them to get put off um, as soon as possible and decide it's not for them. Okay. So it's kind of weird doing that without an audience, Theo. I heard you yeah. chuckling a couple of times. 
Um, but but no, we, need, we, we need like an audio track. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 like canned laughter. Yeah. That would have been good. That's what we need. <laughs> mm. uh, yeah, so obviously I am joking. Um, but it, I, but those these 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 things aren't aren't a joke. Like they are real. I've seen seen them many many times in different places, and I'd be interested to run that to. Is it the third poll? Yeah, just like just to understand where what what of that pain other people resonates with the people who are listening. This one's multiple choice. Yeah. So I'm going to just stay quiet for a minute while you'll have a meditation on that. Anything but canned laughter. It's developing nicely. So I've got a surprise, a surprise around not budgeting for infrastructure and DevOps. I have seen it a few times, but it generally seems to be something that people, people figure out in the end. Oh, it's going down. It's quite an even split, no? It is actually, yeah, yeah. I mean, my real bugbear is keeping the pressure on. I feel like it's so unfair on the team. Um, why do you Why do you rate that as the the biggest one? Well, it's it's very hard for the team to have any control over that. Um, you know, it's it's more of a sort of political problem, and it it require it's about having broader buy in than than perhaps the people that the team have got influence over and recognizing that it's an investment and believing in the, uh, the, the return on that investment that's going to come later. And it really does stifle things badly for teams when they're, when they have a lot of pressure on them and they really don't get any space to, to learn. It seems like a real problem to me. Mm. I think that's need metrics to ensure our teams are following BDD. Mm. Really so before I end this poll, if anyone's got any questions, just just dump them in the Q and A box, and uh, and I'll end this poll now, so you can see what other people are saying. Oh, do they not get to see the poll until? I think I get like a magic you... button that I can press. It. Right. So there you have it. So slightly, it's messy backlog, but gosh, almost all of them are are doing doing quite strongly aren't they okay so i'm going to flip this around i'm going to turn this into some advice what we have seen work time and time again is to start with a single team start with a single team and start with a single user story so in some ways this alleviates that issue of keeping the pressure on because realistically it's going to be hard for you to find a team that don't need to don't have any pressure on them to deliver at all don't have any expectations around them um, and we like this pattern uh, that I learned from a guy called Richard Lawrence, which is called the slow lane, where you carry on doing everything else that you would normally have done um, on this one team. You take this one team, you teach them some skills, you, you carry on doing everything else you would normally have done, but you pick just one story, one story, and nice, easy story, but representative, the right kind of shape, right kind of size, and you do everything on that story by the book and you let that story take as long as it needs to take. And the purpose of delivering that story is not to deliver the feature, but it's to learn how to do BDD. It's learn how to do example mapping. It's to learn how to turn the examples into Gherkin. It's to learn how to automate that Gherkin against your application. It's to learn how to do test driven development from those failing scenarios on your application. And it's to see how few defects you were able to find in that story when you then started to do some exploratory testing on it. And you put that story in the slow lane and you learn from it. You learn, um, you learn what infrastructure did you need? What automation did you need? You start to build that stuff so that you're ready. So that the next story, when you do the next one, it's going to go faster and you keep building from there. And then maybe next sprint, you're happy to take two stories and then take three. And before you know it, this one team, are doing all their stories this way because they because they have now put the investment in and it is faster. And once you've got one team that are doing it this way and they're demonstrating success, now you've got an exemplar that you can point everybody else in the organization to and say, look at this. Is this the kind of success you would like to have too? 
So start with a single team is a, is a sound piece of advice from our experience. And from a management point of view, it's really important to give explicit support. So not just tolerate people doing this stuff, not just implicitly support them by perhaps buying them some training or, or some books um, or, or even going and having a quiet word with the product owner to, to explain the benefits, but keep on giving their explicit support. What I see is that developers, we developers feel guilty about how long our stuff takes. Um, it always ends up taking as long as longer than we thought it would. And we are naturally, most of us, going to shy away from this kind of slowing down to speed up thing um, unless we are regularly being encouraged to do that. So explicit support, regular support is, is the right thing to do, not this kind of mandatory, you know, um, you have to do this or else. So there's a different, different tone there and, and I think it's important. And talking of the keeping the pressure on and the, and the relationship with the business it's getting out there and selling the benefits so do your homework find out the benefits be able to explain those benefits to the business people to whom like all of this stuff the agile um the bdd it's all just detail it's all just noise it's all just technical jargon all they want is is uh well they want business problems solved right they want, um, they want their business problems solved. So explain to them in the terms that they're going to, that are going to make sense to them, what kind of benefits they're going to get. They're going to see faster cycle time. They're going to see a higher quality product. They're going to see fewer defects and explain to them that that's going to take time. Use these analogies about sports people to help them understand there's going to need to be some investment, find the right individuals in the business to work with to sponsor this on, on certain teams. So when you're trying to pick that first team, find the team that's going to have that support. You've got a, a product owner that gets it, that understands it. So that you've again, you, you're kind of giving yourself a, a, a how do we call it? Like um, an, env yeah, an environment that's going to be friendly to that, to that little, little seedling. Make sure you're investing in infrastructure. Don't force everybody to, you know, share the same rickety old build server sitting under somebody's desk with uh, steam coming out of it. Make sure that everybody's empowered to set up machines. Make sure that they're getting training about scripting deployments. Make sure that you're not locking them into expensive uh, per seat licensed databases that can't be spun up on developer workstations. Make sure your, your infrastructure is testable and invest in that. And instead of working in silos, instead of fo focusing on the tools, focus on discovery, start with discovery. So we think about BDD as having these three practices. You start with discovery, which is just conversations. You take ideas, you talk about the ideas, the, the user stories, and refine them until they're well enough understood that you can formulate them into Gherkin. And those two practices, the discovery and formulation, you can do those without doing any automation at all, no tooling. And you get a huge amount of benefit just from doing that work, that collaborative work to examine the user story and decide what it is that you need to build. So start with that stuff, get to the tools later when there's some stuff that you want to automate because you're going to get a lot of benefit from changing the way that people are interacting with each other. And Rather than having QAs working separately to developers, start to get this idea that quality is everyone's responsibility and work together to try and build the best product you can. Have the QAs coming in early into meetings early to test the requirement, to test the understanding of the requirement, to talk about how they, the kinds of things they can see that they would do to break it so that developers can build in fixes for those defects rather than writing the defects and you having to find them later. And try and foster communities of practice. So um, as the, the ideas do spread across multiple teams, make sure that you're buying space, buying time for people who are learning 
specialisms on individual teams to get together and share that learning across the organization. That's a really good way to avoid having to bring in external experts like us because you've got an awful lot of learning that's going on in your organization. And the more you can do facil to facilitate that learning, the, the more powerful uh, uh, and, and, and rapid an adoption you're going to have. And talking about your messy backlog, it's really important to get good at the basics. Um, just, you know, using JIRA and using story points isn't necessarily enough to get you good enough to be able to start to do this stuff. You may well need to have training for your product owners so that they learn how to do this as a, as a professional job rather than it just being something they do part time while they actually still do their day job in the business. Actually, a lot of people tell me that um, it's better to have somebody who knows how to be a product owner and learns the domain than somebody who knows the domain and learns how to be a product owner because there's a lot to being a good product owner. And um, it's not necessarily something that can, people can just learn overnight and it's not something they can necessarily do as a part-time job. So get good at the basics, get good at product ownership. It's a really important input into, into making BDD a success. And as far as working with people with experience, I mean, I'm biased here because uh, we're people with experience and we think we can help. Um, I think it's really important that you seed your teams with people who have done test-driven development before. Uh, that's one of the patterns I see where we, we see great success um, is where there's one or two developers who've tried this and they get it and they're willing to teach the rest of the team how to do it. And then also, you know, the patterns that we see around providing training and providing coaching and mentoring support for the teams. It's a really good way to, to accelerate this process and make sure that people don't kind of lose their nerve in the early stages. Yeah, publishing your feature files, making sure that when they get written, they remain a shared artifact. They don't disappear off into source control so using tools like our own cucumber pro or um one of the many uh so ci plugins that will publish your your feature files um these are these are important things to do to make sure that the feature files get regarded as documentation more than just tests more than just a technician's artifact they they belong to the whole team and yeah avoid the legacy code bases at, at, at at first pass. Um, if you must do this on a legacy code base, if, and when I say legacy code base, I basically take uh, um, Michael Feather's definition of uh, legacy code base is any code base that doesn't have automated tests. And if you're going to start introducing this stuff on a legacy code base, please, you know, start with baby, baby steps, take a little defect and again put it in the slow lane and figure out how to do the automation because it is going to be really hard <clears throat> hard it's a hard environment to learn how to do tdd so the people who are doing it have really got to be determined and to be honest you know if you're going to be cutting your teeth i really would try and do that on a much gentler environment a greenfield project or a much smaller project um because your your legacy code base is going to have a lot of barriers that are going to get in the way and they're going to discourage people and um, a lot of learning opportunities for sure but again, you know, bringing in outside expertise to help you through that learning can be important to make sure people don't lose their nerve. All right. Well, that's my 10 ways that you can fail and what I suggest you can do about it. We've got a couple of questions. Yes, we do. Where should we start, Theo? Start at the top. I mean, this one seems to relate to the kind of cycle you're talking about, about what kind of basis you can go in. So, um, Benjamin Bischoff um, asks, so our system under test completely existed, but it's still being developed before we started automated testing. So for us, QA and the PO wrote the features and the QA actually implemented the glue toad, but all in retrospect. So it's not BDD. So is it possible 
starting with BDD at this point was only advisable on completely new applications? Yes, it is possible. It's not too late. And, you know, you have invested in some of the infrastructure and, and skills that are needed to do BDD, right? Because you've got some glue code, you've, you've figured out how to automate your, your app. Um, you've got Cucumber running, hopefully, as part of your CI CD pipeline. Um, it's just that the tests are being developed after at the moment. But there's no reason why you can't transition from that to saying, let's put one story in the slow lane. Let's take this one story and let's do this by the book. Let's do it the way that Matt would want us to do it. Let's make sure we don't write a line of code that isn't being pushed to us because we've got a failing test, whether it's a, a BDD test, a, a scenario, or whether it's a, a unit test. Let's do test-driven development to develop all the code. And before we even do that, Let's make sure that we are working to collaboratively discover and agree on, on the scenarios that we use to describe the functionality. So yet yeah, you're going to have loads of existing functionality that probably isn't documented at all. You've got into the habit of uh, writing feature files and automating them after the fact, but that doesn't mean that any new changes that come along, you can't start doing them in this way. It's not necessarily going to be easy if the code wasn't designed for test automation. And that's another reason why it's a really good idea to get the developers and the QAs working together on the automated tests and not leave it as being somebody else's job. But this is, again, it's going to require investment. It's going to require people to be ready to slow down. So pick a story where there's no urgency on it. Um, get everybody bought into this idea and run it as an experiment. See how it goes. See what you learn from doing it. Okay. So Elizabeth asked when, when you were talking about infrastructure, can you provide a guide for the right infrastructure for those learnings? The right infrastructure for the people. I don't quite understand the question, Theo. What do you think it means? I'm not sure. The people learning or for, for, yeah, I think it is. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess, Elizabeth, but you could clarify in the chat if you want, that what you mean is can we, can we provide a guide for the right infrastructure for people who are learning about this stuff? Um, so it's quite a difficult question to answer because it really depends on what your application is. I mean, essentially, what you need is a single script that anyone on the team can run that will set up the whole application running um, and then allow you to run tests against it on your local workstation or then you know you can then give that same script to a, a continuous integration server so that it can run it to set up your application and run tests against it um, and what that infrastructure scripting looks like depends on the complexity of your app if you're using something like ruby on rails it's pretty much built into the framework. It's very, very easy to do. Um, if your app is more complex and built of, you know, myriad Docker images and so on, um, you're going to have a bit more, more work to do to set that up. But the, the, the essential principle there is that what you need to have is a single script that will stand up your application. Pretty similar to how it looks in production. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but representatively similar so that when you run automated tests against it, if those tests are passing, you're confident that the application is probably going to work in production. There might be some, some other things that you'll need to test when it goes out into different environments, but the, the, it, you, you're able to, to spin it up in a, you know, it's like a laboratory environment, right, where you can, you can run your tests against it. Okay. Maybe Ted, let's, Ted. Yeah, let's, maybe let's, uh, let's try this one. It's our final one, perhaps. So before getting into the success path and create conditions for BDD success, what might be the conditions required to introduce BDD into a team and change habits? Change the habits of the team, yeah. So I, I think, as I said, one of the things that's important is to focus your efforts on a single team. So try and find within the organization the team that you think has the greatest chances of success and i mean that might be your team because you don't have any influence over other teams in, in your organization that's fine um uh, so focusing in on on a single team and again trying to get them to just pick 
a single story that looks like something that you can you can work on and i guess before you even do that it's getting the team bought into the idea that this this could work for them that this could solve a problem that they have so you know whenever you you want to introduce change somewhere the first thing you need to do before you propose the solution is help everybody to recognize the problem right if you want um you know if you want somebody to quit drinking they first need to admit that they have a problem with drinking if you want a team to quit um building software backwards they first have to recognize that they are producing too many defects that they are blowing out on their estimates that they are um you know shipping uh, features that 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 they didn't need to build so if you see any of those problems surfacing if you see any of those problems manifesting help the team gently compassionately to recognize that they have those problems and propose that bdd might be a solution to those problems and could we try it should we try it yes we'd like to try it then get them the support they need so whether it's you know buying books for the team getting people like us to come train them or, or watching videos whatever it is skill them up and start with the simple stuff start with the discovery stuff um because it's really easy to do you know just read the blog post on example mapping and you can start trying to do example mapping on your team um and you will get benefit from doing that right away without doing any of the other stuff just just using examples to try and understand the story before you start work on it um so conditions required to introduce bdt into a team so yeah i guess the conditions required to introduce it are it looks like a solution to a problem that the team recognizes that they have and can accept that they have right so i think that's the conditions you need to have ted okay i hope that helps please give us feedback in the chat ted elizabeth thank you for your feedback fantastic oh that's nice to hear thank you <laughs> Someone's also commented on your beard, by the way. Um, yeah. Up for that. Um, I think we should probably wrap it up there. What, what we try and do um, is answer these questions offline. Um, we have a Slack um, group, if you don't know about it. Um, and you can go to that if you go to pcumber.io slash support. And then it's like a hashtag Slack. I might just try and put that in the, in the chat before we go. Yeah, good idea. Um, and as I said, also, we have all our kind of videos and stuff from previous webinars. The web today's webinar will also go up on our YouTube channel. Um, and I'll send you an email about that tomorrow when that's live. Theo, there was a thing, right? Because we've got three questions here from uh, Sergio, Mark, uh, Cosmos, and Ted's got another one. Um, last time when we closed this webinar, we lost those questions, didn't we? Let's try and just grab them, screen, screenshot them now. Uh, I don't think we did. Oh, I, I saw them disappear, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay. Because <laughs> right. um, what I'm just saying is, is we could answer those um, either on a blog post or in Slack because they're all interesting questions. Yeah. Um, and it's a shame not to have time to answer them. But yeah, if, if you want to hop on the Slack and we can talk about it some more, that would be really, really cool. Cool. Thanks, everyone. We'll, we'll try and do another one another time. And uh, if you have any suggestions for the kind of stuff that you want to hear about, a particular part of BDD or just Agile in general, um, just let us know in the email or on Twitter. We're at Cucumber BDD and all those places and stuff. So, yeah, thanks for everyone for attending. Thanks, Matt, for doing it. And, uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Thanks, Theo, for co-hosting. All right, we'll get the canned laughter next time. That's what we'll yeah. do. <laughs> All right, see you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.